Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate version one course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course, known as CBROPS. Module 14, Common Threats and Attacks. So in this video, we're looking at malware, common attacks, things like reconnaissance, access, social engineering, denial of service, buffer overflows, and a invasion so again we're covering light explanation of these not super in-depth but at least for a basic level of understanding so first group malware <clears throat> first of all there are different types of malware normally we refer to malware as code or software that is designed to do some damage that means it can disrupt steal, or inflict or do other things that might do damage, time, uh, things that consume time, things like that. There are some common versions of malware, even though we like to think of the term virus as just a virus, but virus is a type of malware. Worms and trojans are all different forms of malware. So the interesting part is when we get used to actually being able to describe the different uh, malicious code as what it is it makes it easier so again the most common ones so this is not a complete list this is just the common ones viruses worms trojans we also have things that might be like adware or ransomware or other versions of where all right so let's look at viruses a little bit more in depth so a virus is a type of malware and it spreads itself by making a copy of itself in another program. So after the program is run, then the virus min spreads its code further and further, thus infecting as many computers as possible. A simple virus may install itself in one line of code, maybe the 50th line of code. It just kind of depends on the sophistication of the virus. Viruses sometimes can be harm harmless, Sometimes it can be very harmful. It really just depends on the motives behind the virus. Most viruses are spread by removable media and email. Those are the most common ways of distributing viruses. Email being number one and rem removable media being number two. Trojan horses. This is also malware. It's a software that appears to be legitimate, but it may contain malicious code. So just like a Trojan horse, like uh, using the Trojan Wars, it pretty much comes in pretending to be something legit, and in reality, it inside is some malicious content. Users are commonly tricked into loading uh, an executable that the Trojan heart is part of, thus being able to load it on their system. The code is fairly uh, flexible. It, some of them, just like viruses, range from easy to more complex. It can cause lots of damage. It can also actually supply remote access to a system, or it can actually create a backdoor into the system. More custom writ Trojan horses with specific targeting is actually extremely difficult to detect and making these a lot harder to get rid of than just a traditional virus. So again, when we're looking at a Trojan horse, we may not even think about it, but Trojan horses can be extremely persistent and extremely painful. Normally, uh, Trojan horses are classified according to the damage that they cause or kind of how they gain access to the system. For example, we have a remote access Trojan horse. We have a proxy or an FTP or a keylogger or a DDoS type Trojan horse. We have a destructive Trojan horse. So depending on what happens, that decides kind of the category of the Trojan horse. Now this is not a complete list. 
These are just some of the different types of Trojan horses. And lastly, we can talk about worms. So worms are similar to viruses because they do replicate themselves, but they actually try to exploit the network. The worm basically crawls through shares and they try to in inject themselves in random locations, sharing themselves through the network. They want to go system to system, hiding their tracks. Worms can run without any host program, and that's the main difference between a virus and a worm. A worm can just run by itself. However, once the host is infected, the worm will spread uh, throughout the system, and it will try to spread through anything connected to that system. In example 20, uh, 2001, Code Red Worm had initially infected about 650 servers. 20 hours later, 300,000 plus servers. So worms are actually increasingly dangerous and can spread. The initial infection of like the NSQL Slammer Worm is known, uh, the worm that ate the internet essentially. Slammer was a DDoS type attack that exploited a buffer overflow bug in Microsoft SQL Server. The number of infected servers kept doubling every few seconds. The infected servers did not have the update or the patch until six months after this issue. Hence, you gotta stay on top of patching, you have to uh, stay on top of protection and actually following the security policies. Not just saying you're going to do them, but actually doing them. So there are a few things that make up a worm. If you're doing the reading inside Netacad, you should be get the video. But in the video, you should be pointing out vulnerability, some type of propagation mechanism, and a payload. These are the three things that make up the worm and kind of how effective they are. So again, enabling the vulnerability. Basically, the worm installs itself using an exploit mechanism. Could be like an email or a Trojan horse or something else. Once that's done, after you gain access to the device, it starts replicating itself. That's the propagation. And then lastly is the actual malicious code that comes from the worm. So the worm components actually have this type of life cycle. Here at the code uh, red worm, we looked at basically uh, 19, 19 days to propagate. After that, they did a DDoS attack. After that, they stopped and uh, went dormant for a few days, and they kept repeating the cycle, and they kept going through it. The thing with worms is they never stop spreading on the internet. After it's released, it will propagate throughout anything it has access to, unless it's found and eradicated. Once the worm actually has made its way onto a system, it's going to try its dangdest to spread all over that system. Since we uh, talked about viruses and, and worms, we also have to talk about ransomware or other forms of wear. Ransomware is a type of malware. It typically denies access to a system resource and that system resource is held hostage until you pay. Normally, it's data but it doesn't always have to be data. It will use encryption algorithms to encrypt data and other files and other objects. Normally it's done through uh, emails or malicious advertising. This is known as malvertising and these are vectors for ransomware campaigns to actually be deployed. Sometimes they're also issued through social engineering and that's when a cyber criminal can pretend to be a security technician doing random phone calls and will get a suspect or a potential victim to download the malware on their machine inadvertently. We have other forms of malware like scareware and adware and spyware. We also have special types of viruses called root kits that kind of actually embed themselves into like core system components. We also have phishing. Fishing is an attempt to convince someone to divulge information, and you pretend to be someone that you're not. 
So these are other forms of malware that are equally scary and also growing. So one thing you're going to keep in mind, malware is made to just make an end user's life a little bit more difficult. Typically, the attacker does want to gain access to someone's system or to someone's information or account or, or something, but it's normally a hindrance if nothing else. So when we look at common malware behavior, for example, that's going to be thinking uh, like the appearance of the desktop might be strange or changing. AV and firewalls may be turned on and off. Systems uh, either running extremely slow, freezing, or crashing regularly. Email spontaneously being sent without your knowledge. That's a telltale sign that there is some malware there. Files being uh, modified or deleted. Resources like memory and processing, upped. Uh, network connectivity issues. Web browser speeds. File browser speeds. Unknown random port opens. And processes listening on ports that typically don't happen. Processes or services running. Or just in general, just weird behavior. We do have a lab looking at and researching forms of malware so do make sure to get that done. All right, the next area is network attacks, looking at reconnaissance, access, and social engineering. So again, the main types of network types of attacks are three main categories, reconnaissance, access, or DOS type attacks. A reconnaissance attack basically is about information gathering or reconnaissance. The attacker, uses the recon or the reconnaissance or information gathering a type of attack to basically see what they can find maybe using unauthorized discovery maybe they're mapping systems services vulnerabilities and this can be done either passively or actively passively meaning not actually interacting with the system or actively actually is hitting the systems to see what's going on Normally, recon attacks precede access or DOS-based attacks. If you know what the system is or what they're running, you're more likely to be able to focus your attack on that specific target system. So recon attacks are typically done first. So what are some of the techniques used by the reconnaissance attacks? Normally, again, the goal is to gather information. They could initiate like a ping sweep or a in-map scan or a vulnerability scan or they may run other uh, exploration type tools like SQL map or some type of social engineering toolkit or NetSparker. It really just depends on how they want to gather information. Uh, normally, you'll see the initial port scan and that'll be like in-map or super scan or net scan. InMap is probably going to be the most common uh, portion of it. So if we're looking at how we do this, we could do it from the internet. And that means maybe uh, scanning into a local network from the internet if that's allowed. You may do some type of open source intelligence to gather information. You may do like who is type lookups and to see addresses. You could also do a ping sweep and that's going to be internal you're going to be assuming that you're on the local LAN to gather information. If you are on the local LAN you may do a port scan and that's where you're going to see what ports, their states, their services and what versions they're running and again that's typically meaning that you're going to be local. If you're doing it through the internet you're going to hit their router or assuming they do have a router you're going to hit their edge and you may only be limited, you will be limited, to whatever information you're able to gather that way. Oftentimes, organizations are not going to have all of their internal machines where they're all sitting on the internet, actually listening and responding to all the different ports that are there. In our reading, we do have a video on the reconnaissance-based attacks, kind of running through what we just talked about. When we're talking network-based attacks, these are going to be things like password attacks or spoofing attacks. 
password attacks are ways to gain access to critical passwords. The spoofing attacks are different ways that the attacker may pose to be someone that they're not. Maybe falsifying data, maybe spoofing their information, all of them to either do things like a trust exploration, a port redirect, possibly man in the middle, or buffer overflow based attacks, all of them again trying to pretend to be something that they're not to get information. Again, trust exploration uh, is one way where we are pretending to be someone else and when we're not, and we pretend because we have the same type of information that our victim may have. A port redirect, that's where we start trying to redirect ports going into our networks to try to bypass their security process. Man in the middle, that is where you actually have someone physically in between the devices, maybe listening or capturing, and being able to relay information. A buffer overflow attack basically sends tons of data and then attempts to overload the target's buffer, thus being able to slip in a little easier. Social engineering, again, we have a video in our lecture if you want to go through that short video. Social engineering attacks typically have phishing or spear phishing. Phishing is, again, being a threat actor, sending fraudulent emails to victims or possible victims pretending to be legitimate. That way you could get them to open the email, click on the link, or provide certain types of information. Before we can do phishing, we have pretexting, and that's where a threat actor pretends to be someone else to confirm information. We have spear phishing, and that's where the threat actor creates a targeted phishing attack tailored to a specific individual or organization, normally going after, you know, a bigger individual. We also still have just a traditional spam type social engineering attacks, and that's just a mass amount of junk mail. Other forms of social engineering could be things like quid pro, uh, pro quo, something for something, uh, baiting. That's where a threat actor will leave malware infected uh, drives or removable media places, hoping someone grabs them. Impersonation or tailgating. Tailgating is where you're following someone in behind uh, extremely quickly. Shoulder surfing is where you're looking over someone's shoulder to look at sensitive information or just plain old simple dumpster diving, looking through garbage to see what you can find. So earlier I'd said something about some type of engineering toolkit or set. The, uh, the social engineering toolkit was designed to help white hat hackers and other professionals create these types of social engineering attacks on their own networks for training. Basically aiding security professionals ethically so that they could educate their users on how to look at and how to protect against very specific types of threats. So there are strengthening the weakest link and that's typically the organization and the personnel. The organization because they may have policies and procedures but they may not actually enforce all of the policies and procedures so that's why they are a pretty weak link. The Social engineering typically targets the person because they are classified as the weakest link. So one of the most effective security measures that you can actually have is to train personnel to be more of a security aware or security conscious type culture. Our next lab is on social engineering and identifying ways to recognize and prevent them. Our next major section is about network attacks, denial of services, buffer overflow, as well as evasion. So again, we do have a simple video in our reading about denial of service attacks. But essentially, a denial of service attack is a way to overload a potential victim so they cannot respond. If you have one person targeting one victim, that's a DOS attack. If you have multiple people targeting one victim, then that's a distributed denial of service or a DDoS based attack. So what's the purpose of a DOS attack? A big part of that is to essentially overwhelm the 
in device with tons of traffic. Sometimes you can do maliciously formatted packets. Sometimes you can just send tons of packets. It really just depends. So when we keep saying DOS, a DOS attack, denial of service, is reuse as much data as possible, just cram it down them, see what happens. Well, one machine may not be able to affect that much traffic. So we have a distributed denial of service or a DDoS attack. And what we can do is we can have things like zombies or bots or a botnet or some type of controller like a handler or a bot master actually control our zombies and bot that kind of makes up the botnet to target a victim. That way you have one device controlling many. In our lecture, we do have a video looking at a simple botnet. We have, a, again, a demonstration of the uh, DDoS app attack using that botnet. And then after that, we have to talk about buffer overflows. The Basically, the, the thing here is buffers have a finite amount of resources. And if you overload them, they may do something that's abnormal. So threat actors will use the buffer overflow DOS attack to find system memory related flaws. That way you can exploit those flaws. For instance, some type of remote denial of service attack was discovered in Windows 10 where the threat actor could create a malicious code to access out of the scope type memory. You would still be able to gain access to a system's machine using that method. You also have the older uh, options like ping of death, where the threat actor will send a ping of death, which is an echo request in an IP packet that will then be received, but it's actually larger than the maximum, uh, maximum packet size, and some machines don't know how to process it, so it just kind of crashes. After that, we have the evasion method. The evasion methods basically are breaking up into a few different categories. Encryption and tunneling. This invasion technique will use the tunneling to hide or scramble the payloads. We have resource exhaustion, and this evasion technique basically will target the host that it's too uh, busy to properly use security detection mechanisms and overload them that way. We have the traffic fragmentation, and in this type of evasion technique, it will split malicious payloads into multiple small payloads so that they're less likely to be found. We also have protocol level misinterpretation. So this evasion technique will occur when the network defense is not properly handled correctly for like a, a PDU and a checksum or a TTL value. If you're able to trick the firewall into ignoring these types of packets, then we can have a protocol level misinterpretation. We also have a, tra a traffic substitution and a traffic inser uh, insertion type attack. More importantly, we have things like our pivoting. This type of technique assumes the threat actor has already compromised an inside host and they actually start funneling traffic through that host. That way it doesn't look like it's coming from the outside network, but from a local machine that everything is being pivot from. Rootkits are not really a DDoS type of thing. They are evasion technique. This is where you bury a virus or malicious code in a system setting or a system configuration file. That way they're less likely to be found. An experienced threat actor normally goes this route. Lastly, we have things like proxies. That way our traffic isn't going out but our traffic is going to a proxy and then the proxy goes out. That way we can kind of try to evade our traffic from being found out if it's malicious based traffic. All right, that's the end of this chapter. So we looked at things like Trojans and malware types or common types of malware types. We looked at DDoS and DOS based attacks. We looked at access types of attacks. We looked at distributed denial of service based attacks and botnet as well as goals of threat actors. 
If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.